Okay, so we have just learned how to uh, cause a muscle to contract, so we went through that entire process. Uh, and now we're going to talk about metabolism, muscle metabolism. Basically what that means is how your muscles are using the ATP uh, to make those contractions. Remember the myosin pulling along on the actin fibers. And then we're going to talk about muscle twitch type. So remember that the, so these little thin fibers here, these little red fibers here are the actin and these larger, the thick filaments, this is the myosin and these have the little uh, feet that sort of come down and pull on that actin and then move that entire thing together. So keeping that in mind, we have to sort of consider what happens when you actually have a muscle contraction. Um, and imagine now having your arm, your arm fully stretched out. Okay, so this is your elbow, and then so let's say this is this is the muscle. Okay, so this is your hand up here. So this is your uh, this would be your bicep right here. Okay, you can sort of imagine that when it's completely stretched out, that you're not going to have as much strength in pulling. Now the reason for that is that if we look down here at increased length, when the length is increased. Look at how many of these myosin heads are not going to be able to contact the actin. Okay, so that means when it's stretched out, you've got this guy right here that has nothing to pull on. Okay, so all of these have nothing to pull on because there is no actin in that when you're when you're completely stretched out. Now, if you go the other way and you flex your arm completely, again, there's your hand and then there's the bicep muscle. Okay? When it's completely contracted, you're more over here in this situation where you have, it's, it's lined up to the point that the actin is actually overlapping. You can kind of see that right there. The actin is actually overlapping. So you don't have a lot of strength. You don't have a lot of ability to pull because there really isn't anywhere to pull at some point. So what this graph is showing is that when you're completely flexed, you have in this y-axis, this is tension, you have almost no tension. Okay, So at some point you've, you've contracted it to the point where you just can't go anywhere else. Uh, and so you have no tension, really no strength. But then as, you, as it gets longer and it's somewhere kind of in the middle, so if you're like, you know, if your arm is bent kind of like this, and there's your muscle again, when it's somewhere in the middle, you actually have the best tension, okay? So you have the most contact, and that's the way we need to think about it. Um, we might be able to sort of think, well, yeah, well, that just makes sense. But if you look at what's going on with the muscle, you have the most contact between the myosin heads and the actin filaments. So you're going to have more of these guys that are able to pull, which is going to give you more tension. That's why this is highest right here. Okay, and then again, as you stretch out and these things move aside, then you can see that you don't have that anymore. So that's what this graph is showing. So if you look at the best, so the most strength you can have is when your muscle is neither stretched out nor contracted fully. So kind of like in this case, there again is the hand, this case where it's somewhere in the middle and that's where you have the most strength. Okay, so we needed to get that out of the way. Um, now, a couple of things we're going to talk about in this section. We have already talked about how ATP is used, and I remember we looked at a couple of things. We said that, you know, first of all, um, energizing the myosin head is where the ATP hydrolysis took place, so you need to remember that. Um, that's our equation we use. That's when the myosin head is moved to this position to get it cocked and ready to go. I, I made the analogy of setting a mousetrap. And then we also talked about how in order for this, when it's, when it's connected here, the only way to get the myosin head to disconnect from the actin filament is to put a new ATP on it. And, then, and so that means that every single myosin head of all of these myosins that are that are making up the muscle cell, every single one of them needs a new ATP every time it attaches, power stroke, releases. It needs a new ATP. That's a ton of ATP. Okay, so um, 
so that's what this is saying a huge amount of ATP is needed to power the contraction cycle plus you know you have you have calcium being moved in and out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum so you have a pump that also uses ATP okay to pump that calcium back out you don't want to just leave the calcium out there because as long as calcium is present you have this cross bridge cycling and you have a contraction okay so so you have you, you require ATP a lot of ATP for muscle contractions so there are a few different ways uh, we have to make the ATP and there are a couple of different ways remember we talked about anaerobic which involves glycolysis okay so if this well it's kind of hard to imagine but if this entire thing is a cell it's missing a lot of stuff but um, you can see that you have inside here the mitochondria so this is the mitochondria and remember glycolysis takes place outside the outside the mitochondria no oxygen required but you only get two ATP for every glucose because remember glucose is our energy of choice so glucose is constantly moving in but if you don't have oxygen present, you're only getting two ATP. You're getting them fairly quickly, I mean comparatively quickly. However, if you really want to be efficient, you have to move over this over here. So we call this anaerobic when it's happening outside without oxygen, and that's what anaerobic means. But if you really want to be efficient and make 34 to 38, um, then you have to move over into the mitochondria and you need oxygen. So what occurs in the mitochondria is aerobic respiration. So keeping that in mind and then looking at this, ATP must be produced by the muscle fiber after reserves are used up. Okay, so that means that when you first start a muscle contraction, let's say you're going to get up and run out the door. Let's say your house is on fire. You're going to get up and run out the door. You have only, because you're burning so much ATP, you only have enough ATP for a few seconds. A few seconds. And that's it. The ATP is gone. So you have to be ready to go to make more ATP. Um, so we're going to talk about the three different ways. I just mentioned anaerobic, anaerobic, but there's one that takes place before those even take place, and that's called creatine phosphate. You may have heard of creatine uh, as like a, a supplement, and what creatine does, and, I'll, and I have two slides dedicated to this, but in short, what it does is it holds a phosphate group, and then as soon as the ATP is burned and, that, and the ADP floats away, so down here, so as soon as that ATP, after that, after the, uh, after the charging, the uh, energizing, and then the power stroke, the ADP falls off. Well, there's a creatine phosphate group that just sticks another phosphate back on there, and this one's then ready to go to be another ATP. So that's what creatine phosphate does. The other two, anaerobic and aerobic, that's what we were just talking about here. Okay, so that's ways to make ATP as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, or to make it as quickly as possible after after this, but that's that's actually making ATP from glucose. Okay, so the aerobic and the anaerobic are making it. So this is from glucose. Okay, all right, and that's what we need to keep doing to keep to keep a muscle to keep a muscle going. So let's uh, think about this. You've, like I said, most people have heard about creatine in some way or another especially if you you know you're into fitness or weightlifting or something like that um, and so what happens is that right now as you're sitting there assuming you're not you know on a treadmill or jogging or something while you're listening to this you're probably making as much ATP as possible okay you probably have um, aerobic respiration and you're making and you're making ATP and so you're loading up but once you've made enough ATP, what tends to happen is you, you have this other little molecule called creatine, and you're putting phosphate groups on that. Okay, so that's something else that you start making. Okay, and there's a, there's a reason for this, and that is that even making ATP as quickly as possible through glycolysis, 
okay, which you shouldn't be doing right now. You should be doing it the most efficient way, which is through the Krebs cycle in the electron transport chain. But even doing it through glycolysis is 10 steps. Okay. And then when you add, and when you look at, well, I guess we don't have it up there, but then when you look at uh, the Krebs cycle, it's many, many, many steps to, to make ATP. Here, by when you're resting, by making this creatine phosphate, what happens is that you start to run and all your ATP turns into ADP, okay? And that's worthless, not entirely worthless, but in terms of energy for your, uh, for your muscle contraction, it's, it's not gonna do you much good. So the only choice is either to use glycolysis in 10 steps or, or the Krebs cycle in many, many, many more than 10 steps. One of the choice is to just say, okay, there's this ADP. We're just going to, in one step, add a phosphate group to that to make ATP. Okay, and that's what creatine phosphate does. So if you're, as soon as you burn all your ATP, you have this creatine phosphate that's just sitting there. That's its job. It's just sitting there, and as soon as all these ADP start popping out because you're burning all your ATP, then it starts adding phosphate groups to it. Uh, and so that keeps you going. So that means that you don't just get up when your house is on fire. You don't just get up, start running, run for three seconds, and then collapse because you're out of ATP. The next step is for this creatine phosphate to start adding phosphate to the ADP and producing ATP. And that'll keep you going for about 15 seconds. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to move through. We had you know, we had our first step, which was just using the ATP that was there. And now we have this creatine phosphate st step that keeps you going for about 15 seconds or so. Uh, it depends on the person, I suppose. And it depends on if you're preloading with creatine that can keep you going for a couple of more seconds. Um, okay, so, um, so this is just another example of the same thing. This is just so, sort of showing that as you're resting, you're making this creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine, it goes by both names. And then when you're working, that creatine phosphate donates, donates its phosphate group to the ATP to make a, or to the ADP to make ATP quickly. So the, uh, the next step, if you're kind of following along and we've already talked about it, um, remember we have anaerobic respiration. So a review, anaerobic respiration, we generally refer to that as glycolysis, okay? Anaerobic, no oxygen required, okay? And that's glycolysis, okay? Now that can make, that's a pretty continuous supply. As long as your, your, your blood is pumping and you're getting glucose to the cell, you, or the, uh, the cells, or you can clip it off of the glycogen, remember the chains. So we have a pretty steady supply of glucose, this would be glycogen. See where all this stuff's coming together that you've already learned? So the glycogen, and then it just pops that off and it has a glucose molecule. And from that glucose molecule through the glycologist mechanism, you can get to ATP relatively quickly. Okay, so that means that if we're following along, house is on fire. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to catch your house on fire. Um, house is on fire. You get up, three seconds, the ATP you had is gone. You keep going, about 15 seconds, the creatine phosphate is gone. So you're, you're about 15, 17 seconds in. Are you going to collapse? No. Then you're going to start burning the glucose, but because you're running at top speed, um, you're going to do it without the oxygen because you don't have the oxygen pumping yet. Your heart isn't beating harder. You're not breathing heavier. You could be holding your breath, right? Smoke. Uh, and so, so you don't necessarily have enough oxygen available. Uh, and so you switch into this anaerobic first thing. So uh, this glycolysis, okay? So, um, so remember glycolysis, series of ATP producing reactions that do not require oxygen, okay? But they only make it to ATP. Glucose is used to generate ATP when the supply of creatine phosphate is depleted. So now we're getting glucose involved. Okay, it's found in the blood or from glycogen. So we mentioned that. Uh, breaks down glucose into molecules of pyruvic acid. Okay, 
So one of the waste products of making this is pyruvic acid. Okay, uh, or pyruvate. And then that can then go into, and this is what we're seeing here, the pyruvate, if you have enough oxygen available, will go into the mitochondria or, I know there's so much stuff, or after glycolysis, it can produce, and what we usually think of, it can produce ethanol, other products, but we usually we think of it as producing lactate. Okay, so with no oxygen, pyruvic acid turns into lactic acid or lactate. Okay, that's when you feel your muscles kind of, that's when you feel the burn, is that buildup of lactic acid. That's not what makes you sore. Uh, but that is, you can feel that when, when you start to push your muscles very hard, very fast, okay? You feel that uh, lactic acid. And then that lactic acid has to go on later on and be turned, turned back into glycogen. And then you have the entire process going again, okay? But that's not very efficient, right? Uh, because you're only, I mean, you have to keep the supply of glucose coming. Uh, and so, so it can't keep up. Now just think about that. I mean, you have to have, it's very, this is a very expensive process because you're only making two ATP, okay, for every glucose. And we know, we know that really if we get the mitochondria involved, we can make like 38, okay? But if you're running out of your house and you haven't had a chance to get your blood pumping and get your oxygen uh, supplies going, that we're stuck with this, okay? And we can keep this going for about 30 to 40 seconds, okay? So now you collapse, right? So now you've gotten up, you've used your ATP that you had, and then you, um, you use the creatine phosphate pathway to keep you going for about 15 seconds longer, and now you're using this anaerobic mechanism to keep you going for about 30 to 40 seconds and then you collapse no what you do is your body says it's done you've you've pretty much used everything you can and this if you've ever tried exercising and you start out and you're running and you feel great hey this is fine and then you know a few a minute or so into it all of a sudden you're like okay i'm tired and you start to breathe heavier that's that point where you have to, you have to start using oxygen. You have to switch to the aerobic mechanism because you're burning the glucose way too fast. It's going way too fast and you're not getting enough ATP to sustain it, okay? So yeah, after about 30 to 40 seconds, 30 seconds to a minute around that time, that's it. Then you have to start switching into aerobic respiration. Remember, aerobic respiration uses oxygen but is very efficient, okay? Because you're getting about 36 to 38 ATP for every glucose, okay? <clears throat> so, activity will last longer than about a half a minute, depends on aerobic respiration. And really, you know, the truth is these things all kind of start up at the same time. It's, it's which one is preferred at the time. Um, but it's easier for us for, to think linear, linearly that one stops, the next one starts, the next one stops, and then and so on. So one after the other, which it kind of occurs in that order, uh, but they do. They kind of overlap a little bit. Um, but then we start this we, we start this aerobic respiration, <clears throat> and uh, that pyruvic acid. Okay, so instead of the pyruvate that was produced from glucose, which remember made us two ATP. Okay, so this can then either move into here. Or, as we saw before, if you don't have oxygen, it turns into lactic acid. But if you do have oxygen, it moves into here, and that's when you have the most efficient way to make ATP. Okay, so that's when your cells really start making ATP efficiently. Okay, 36 to 38. 
case, so pyruvic acid entering the mitochondria is completely oxidized, generating ATP and, of course, the waste products, carbon dioxide, water, which we don't care about, and, uh, and heat, so that it also generates heat, which is why we can shiver and produce heat. So each molecule of glucose yields about 36 molecules of ATP. Um, muscle tissue has two sources of oxygen, okay? So this is, this is kind of important. Oxygen from the blood is hemoglobin. Okay, so we talk about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is how oxygen is carried in the blood. However, it's also carried in the cells by a very similar molecule called myoglobin. Okay, myo means muscle. So it's the same, it has the same basic structure as hemoglobin except it exists in the muscle cell. Okay, so, okay, I hope you're listening. Myoglobin tends to be red in color and its job is to carry oxygen, okay? So if you have a cell or a muscle that really requires a lot of oxygen, you're going to have a lot of myoglobin. Now I said that for a reason and we'll see uh, later on. Okay, so myoglobin and hemoglobin are oxygen binding proteins, uh, so they carry oxygen, carry oxygen, and then aerobic respiration supplies ATP for a prolonged activity. So as long as we have oxygen present here, oxygen present, so we start breathing heavier, we're trying to get that oxygen into the cell, okay, into the muscle cells so they can make the ATP, so they can do this route, okay. Aerobic respiration supplies ATP for a prolonged activity. So now Let's go back over it again. First, we had the ATP we already had, which lasted a few seconds. Then we had the creatine phosphate pathway, which lasted about 15. And then we had anaerobic, which was glycolysis, that gave us ATP for about 30 to 40 seconds. Okay, this was only about three seconds for the ATP that's in you right now. So now we get to aerobic. And aerobic it depends on how long you want to run. Okay, aerobic respiration provides more than 90% of the needed ATP in activities lasting more than 10 minutes. So the longer you go, the slower your body is going to your body is going to come out. And if you're interested in, in fitness or anything like that, then yes, your body will tell you to slow down. It will it will come across as being you're exhausted. It's painful. You don't like it. It will force you to slow down to match the speed at which you're able to make ATP to keep your muscles contracting, okay? <clears throat> so if you're a new runner or something like that and you get exhausted very, very quickly, what your body will do is it will actually start making more mitochondria, okay? So this is what happens over a few weeks when you're training. You'll start making more mitochondria in your muscle cells so you can get this process going, this aerobic respiration, more mitochondria means that you get more, aer more aerobic respiration, so then you have better endurance, okay? So you're going to run very, very slowly. If this is the first time you've run in, you know, five or ten years, um, and then you just start up like this, your, your, your muscle cells have gotten rid of most of their mitochondria, okay? They, they have what they need for you to maintain enough energy to, uh, to sit on the couch. Uh, but if you start running a lot, it'll start increasing the number of mitochondria, and, and you'll be able to run for a longer period of time. That's what training is about. Also, another thing is that what else do you need for this entire process to take place? You need a constant supply of oxygen. So, so one of the things that is a, is a problem is that even though you have, you may have increased the number of your mitochondria that are inside your cell and you're trying to make ATP in the most efficient way possible, if you don't have a fast enough, it, it all depends on the supply of oxygen coming to your muscle cells. And if you don't have a fast supply of oxygen, then that's going to be your limiter. Your, your muscle cells are like, yeah, you know, we have everything we need. We have all these mitochondria. We have plenty of glucose. All we need is oxygen, and that tends to be what limits us in, in how far, fast, and hard we can, we can run or exercise, is this supply of oxygen. And so one of the other things that happens when you're training is that you increase vascularization, okay? So you'll increase the number of capillaries 
because that's what's carrying the oxygen, right? So you may increase the number of capillaries both to your muscles and to your to your lungs, actually. Okay, so you'll get more vascularization in your lungs, and that's going to help with oxygen exchange, oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, and then that's also part of this fitness training. This is why when you first run or you first start doing aerobic exercise, whatever that might be, uh, you have trouble. And then after a while, you you kind of, you're, you're able to do it a little bit more. Okay, so let's just talk about what muscle fatigue is. We sort of understand what muscle fatigue is, and we might be able to figure it out by now just based on the stuff we've been talking about. You know, we're talking about we need an ATP supply. Um, well, if you don't have ATP, then, then you're going to feel tired, and your brain... You don't. You aren't aware. Of course, your muscles are sending your brain the message, uh, and they know what's wrong. But all you get is the message saying, "Okay, I'm exhausted. I have to stop." Okay. So muscle fatigue is the inability of the muscle to maintain force. Okay. So that after prolonged activity. So that means your muscles are just sort of giving up. We don't necessarily always know what it is. Okay. What the factors that are making our muscles give up are. Uh, it could be that they just aren't releasing enough calcium. Think about that. Calcium has to be released from this sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay, inside the cell. So calcium has to be released. So if you're not able to release enough calcium, if you don't have enough, uh, that's going to cause you problems. Uh, your creatine phosphate, remember, that's that first 15 seconds after you've burned your ATP that you have creatine phosphate that's going to keep you going. Well, if you don't have enough of that, then that's going to cause problems. And a big one we already discussed is not enough oxygen. If you don't, if you don't have O2, then you're not going to be able to make the ATP in the later steps, in the aerobic steps. Uh, glycogen, which is you know that chain of glucose. If you don't have enough glucose, then you have fatigue. Okay. Um, Buildup of lactic acid and ADP. That's how your muscles know. Lactic acid, waste product, right? It's that pyruvate can't go into the mitochondria. You don't have enough oxygen, whatever. You have this buildup of lactic acid. You have this buildup of ADP. All of these things send a message to your brain, and your brain says, we're done, okay? All right, so failure of the motor neuron to release enough acetylcholine, okay? So remember, acetylcholine has to be released. If you, there are cases where you can be depleted of acetylcholine, and so where this, this muscle fiber or this uh, motor neuron is trying to release acetylcholine to the muscle to tell it to contract. Well, if you don't have enough acetylcholine, then that's not going to be able to take place either. Okay, so the, all of those things, all of the things that we've learned about and talked about, if any one of them is disrupted, we interpret that as muscle fatigue. Okay, um, and then this is also just sort of common sense. Oxygen co consumption after exercise. Well, if you exercise for a long time and then you stop, do you immediately go back to breathing just the way you were when you were at rest? And we know the answer is no. After you get done exercising, you continue to breathe heavily for quite a while, okay? And it depends on how in shape you are actually as to how long that continues. But you have a debt. You have an oxygen debt. You You've burned all your ATP. Your muscle cells are, are I mean, it's, it's just chaos in there. They don't have the ATP. They're not able to run their pumps. They're not able to do all the stuff that they're supposed to be doing. It's finally, your body has finally said, wow, this is painful. Please stop exercising. It's Your body has finally listened to you and stopped exercising. And now you have a period of time that you're trying to fix it. Okay? And so... So you have to replenish that oxygen, and that's what we call oxygen oxygen debt. Okay. So the ox the added oxygen is used to restore muscle cells to the resting level. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense to convert the lactic acid into glycogen. Okay. So we need to get rid of all this lactic acid. So we do that, and we convert it back into glycogen, which is that chain of glucose molecules, to make more creatine phosphate. Like I said, that's something you're doing right now. You're sitting there. You have plenty of ATP, so you're making creatine phosphate, and you're ready to go, okay? Uh, but not after you're done running. That's all That's all used up. And to replace the oxygen, oxygen removed from myoglobin. Remember what myoglobin is? It's just this little molecule that sits inside 
your muscle cells and holds on to oxygen. Okay, so it just binds oxygen molecules. So you've used those oxygen molecules when you were when you were exercising. So those are all gone, and so afterwards you need to put them back. You need to replace those and put them back on the on the on the uh, myoglobin molecule. Okay. All right. So um, there's there's one other thing that we need to that we need to talk about in terms of muscle contraction. And let's say that you're picking up something very light versus something that you're you're picking up something I have no idea why I just started to try to draw a feather, but that's not going to happen. Okay, so you pick up something very light or you pick up something very heavy. Okay? You have to be able to generate different forces. Okay? And now think about it. All we've talked about so far is myosin heads walking along actin filaments and pulling the sarcomere closer together. That's all we've talked about when it comes to actual muscle contraction. So how do we have control over that? Well, we, we, just, we just discussed the amount of stretch before contraction. So we've also covered that. Remember, if, you're, if your muscles are completely stretched out, you won't have as much force or tension. And if they're completely contracted, you won't have as much force or tension. Okay, so we've covered that. Um, now, one of the ways that we can increase force is, and this is something we do, you know, we don't think about doing this, but we do it, and that's we increase the rate at which the nerve impulses go to the muscle. So we have our motor unit, that's what this is called, and this might divide and go to several. So this is, so if we sort of think about this, this is our brain up here. And our brain says, hey, muscle, contract. And this is our muscle down here. Okay, That's our muscle. And so we have these motor units that go down here. And there you can sort of imagine this thing dividing and innervating the muscle. Okay, And so one of the ways to make it stronger is to make it faster. So we just keep releasing faster and faster and faster. Remember, acetylcholine is being released onto the muscle. Okay? It's causing the muscle action potential, and then it's causing the contraction. So if we do that faster, we're going to have a, uh, a more forceful contraction. So the rate at which the nerve impulses uh, arrive. Now, another thing is of course and we also sort of mentioned this the nutrient and oxygen availability okay so you have to have that so we'll just check that off i think we understand that you have to have nutrients and you have to have oxygen by nutrients we primarily not exclusively but mean glucose okay and then there's this next one and we're going to spend some time talking about this the motor unit and i know i just slipped it in on you and i just said this is a motor unit but imagine this if this is one neuron right here coming from the brain and it contacts this much of the muscle imagine if it were even larger and it contacted more of the muscle okay so it's a very large motor unit it just divides and goes all over the place well a large motor unit like this is going to cause a more forceful it's going to cause a more forceful contraction. Okay, so it's going to have more tension. So large motor unit is going to have a more forceful contraction than a smaller motor unit. Except, you know what, the, and that's what we're going to talk about in the next slide, you also give up a lot of control over the muscle. So uh, you think about the muscles in your face, you can, you can take the muscles in your lips, and I shouldn't do that while I'm talking, but you can take the muscles in your lips and you can contract one part of it but not another part. Now you can't do that with your thigh muscles. So your thigh muscles, you know, you pretty much, your brain sends down a signal saying, hey, we're walking, running, whatever, and it will activate huge portions of your thigh muscle. Uh, but there are certain muscles where it where it doesn't with smaller motor units where it doesn't let me let me just go on here because that's what we're talking about is motor units so hopefully you understand it just just from what I've said there 
Um, but if not, then we can, let's see, I want to move that over a little bit. Okay. Um, but if not, let's, let's just kind of go over it again. Okay. So, um, here's, here's a muscle. Okay. Okay. And let's say, I don't know, maybe we can say that's your lip muscle. This is not the best example in the world. And let's say you have a portion that innervates this part of your lip. Even kind of looks like a lip, doesn't it? Now that I, now that I say that. And then you can have another that activates this portion of your lip. Okay. And then we could say there's another that activates this portion of your lip. Okay, so what that does, by having many small motor units, okay, so these all came from different neurons, okay, all the signals all came from your brain, but what that does is it says, okay, we're going to be able to contract this part and separately contract this part and separately contract this part. This gives us very fine control over that. But this is with small motor units. Okay. Okay, so we can't get a forceful contraction unless we activate all of them at once, um, or many more at a time. So, and then I mentioned in your thigh, we'll make this a large muscle because even though your your quadriceps are are four muscles, that's why it's called quadricep. Um, but but the motor units for those are just enormous okay they just cover so much of your thigh which means you have that trade-off you're not able to contract just part of your thigh muscle okay you pretty much contract huge parts of your thigh muscle every time you do it it's very efficient but it doesn't give you the fine control okay so hopefully that makes sense because that's what these pictures are also trying to show it's showing one motor neuron and it's activating all of these muscle cells okay then you have this one that has two motor units and it's about let's see it's would have been nice if it was the exact same number of, of motor muscle cells but it's not uh, but you can see that it's it's activating two separate sections we have the dark purple which is activating these guys and this one and then we have this orange one down here that's activating these okay so that means we have two smaller motor units so hopefully this makes sense so let's just read through this a motor unit consists of a motor neuron and the muscle fibers it stimulates okay so this is a motor neuron here and these are the muscle fibers that it stimulates. Same thing, motor neuron, and these are the muscle fibers it's stimulating. Uh, the axon of a motor neuron branches out with, branches out forming the neuromuscular junctions with different muscle fibers, okay? So that's what, again, that's also what I drew up here, is you have one motor neuron, it branches out, and it contacts several different motor uh, muscle fibers. Control of precise movements consists of many small motor units, again, this is what I drew here, okay? So you have small motor units, but if you imagine, your lips aren't even the best example because um, um, because they you don't have as fine a control as you do with things like voice production and even eye movements. Um, but it does get the point across because we know we can, we can do that experiment on ourselves. We can contract one part of our lip and not the other, which means we have different neurons, different motor units controlling different parts. Uh, we can't do that with our thigh. That's also something we can we can experiment with. We can't just contract one part of our thigh and not the other. Okay, so precise consists of small motor units, muscles that control voice production, have two to three muscle fibers per motor unit. That is amazing. Obviously, speech is very important, and being able to control our tone is very important. Muscles controlling eye movements have 10 to 20 muscle fibers per motor unit. Now, you know, I can't, of course, do this. I can't make 10 to 20. Uh, I could, I guess I almost did there, except in reality, for the thigh muscles, we're talking about 2,000. So that means this one motor neuron here would, would actually go out and make 2,000 connections, just for one. Very efficient. We just say go or don't go. Not a lot of control, um, but it does form a more, a more, powerful, a more powerful contraction. 
Okay, so the total strength of a contraction depends on the size of the motor unit. This is going to be a bit more powerful, and the number that are activated. Okay, so even though we have this, and I'll just draw this very quickly, we can actually activate many more, and they and they may there may be some overlap. Okay, so we can more quickly activate it. Say fast, 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 fast. Here, go, 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 go. And we can activate more of them. Okay, you're all going to go, or you can do both. You're all going to go very, very quickly. We're going to have the most powerful contraction ever. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, there's one more thing we have to cover, um, and we're kind of prepared for it now, if you've been paying attention. Muscle fibers, just read the sentence, vary in their content of myoglobin. What's myoglobin? Myoglobin carries oxygen so it's a molecule it's a protein that carries oxygen it usually carries about four okay so so here we have it we have a myoglobin that's carrying oxygen okay we'll make those blue okay we're making the oxygen blue but we're making the myoglobin red because myoglobin is red. Hemoglobin, which is carrying oxygen in your, in your oxygen in your blood, is also red. That's why our blood's red. Myoglobin, which is carrying oxygen in your muscles, is red, and that's why muscles are red. Right? Muscles red red. And I have that as a question mark because they're all muscles red. What about white meat? Okay, has less myoglobin. That's it. So when we talk about red meat, we're talking about myoglobin. We're talking about something that has myoglobin. So we call these red muscle fibers. They have a high myoglobin content. They appear darker. So dark meat in chicken legs and thighs versus chicken breasts, which have white meat and have lower content of myoglobin. Okay, so why does this matter? Why would we have different types of muscle in the same chicken? Okay, so this chicken has red muscle in its legs and its thighs, contain more mitochondria, Okay, so these red muscle fibers contain more mitochondria. They have more blood capillaries. Why do you think this is happening? Why is there more? Because they're using oxidative. Okay, so they're using the mitochondria. This is uh, aerobic. Okay, I was going to write mitochondria, but it's right there. Okay, so it's using the mitochondria. This is aerobic respiration. Okay, how do chickens get around? They walk, which involves the legs and thighs. That is how a chicken gets around. So it needs to be ready to go for the most efficient way for it to make ATP, which is aerobic. But what happens when you chase a chicken? Okay, when you chase a chicken, okay, this is a chicken, kind of. When you chase a chicken, it will start to try to fly, okay? So usually it tries to fly and then it realizes it can't fly and it lands again, okay? So that's what happens when you do that. Now, when you, when you have an animal, and just think about this for a minute, that's walking around all the time and it wants to have the most efficient way to make ATP. However, in the breasts, the only time a chicken really flaps its wings is when it's trying to get away. So it's for short bursts, which tells us what? It's going to be anaerobic. It doesn't have to have all of this myoglobin. It doesn't have to have all these blood capillaries and mitochondria because it's anaerobic. That's the only time. It's not going to fly for, for long periods of time. Now, if we test this for... Um, let's think about something like a, like a goose. Okay. What color is the breast of a goose? I will give you a hint. It's red. Okay. Why? 
because unlike a chicken who only flies for a few seconds and then lands, a goose migrates, travels thousands of miles, which means it makes more sense for a goose to have red, okay, goose red in the breast, okay, because the breast is the muscle that's causing the flapping, the contractions, okay? So it really comes down to the need. Do I have white muscle fibers or red muscle fibers? And we have both. We have both pretty much in, in all of our in all of our human muscles. This isn't, you know, chicken physiology, but uh, we have both in all of ours. And they're actually divided into, into three groups that we're going to talk about, okay? So, um, so muscle fibers contract at different speeds and vary in how quickly they fatigue. Which one do you think is going to fatigue more quickly? The one that's that's red, has myoglobin, and uh, is able to produce its ATP through oxidative means. By that I mean using oxygen, aerobic. No, that one's not going to fatigue as quickly. The one that doesn't have that is going to fatigue more quickly, if that makes sense. So we'll, we'll go over each one of these three. So we have the three groups, and these are, you need to know these, slow oxidative, slow oxidative, we're talking about, we're talking about mostly aerobic, okay? Fast oxidative glycolytic, we're talking about aerobic and anaerobic. Okay. And it's in the name. Oxidative kind of gives us this, this hint of O2, aerobic. Oxidative glycolytic, glycolytic sort of gives this glycolysis, which is no O2, but very inefficient. Remember, glycolysis. But if there's no O2, anaerobic, but it's very inefficient. That's glycolytic. So this is both. It's both oxidative and glycolytic, and then we just have the glycolytic. Okay, so the chicken breast is going to probably be this area, fast, inefficient, can't go for very long, fatigues quickly. Okay, um, but they're but these tend to be larger and more and stronger. Okay, and they twitch faster. That's why we call them fast twitch. Okay, so slow twitch are slow oxidative. They're smallest in diameter. They're the least powerful. They appear dark red, and they, remember they appear dark red because of the myoglobin. So when somebody says they like their steaks bloody, um, that means that they like myoglobin, not that they like blood because all the blood is gone out of steak. It's drained out uh, right away. So there really isn't any blood in a steak. What they're finding is myoglobin, and then when you cook it, it turns brown. Okay. Uh, generate so slow twitch generate ATP mainly by aerobic cellular respiration, which means we have the mitochondria involved. Okay, so it has a lot of mitochondria. Slower speed of contraction. So a twitch contraction lasts from 100 to 200 milliseconds. Um, they're very resistant to fatigue, capable of prolonged sustained contractions for many hours, so like a chicken walking or you walking or running a marathon or something. Uh, adapted for maintaining posture and for aerobic endurance type activities such as running, well, there we go, running a marathon. Okay, so the next one are fast oxidative glycolytic, which is kind of in between, okay? So intermediate speed, um, they have a lot of myoglo myoglobin and blood capillaries. They have a red appearance, um, but, and they generate considerable ATP by aerobic respiration. However, they're only moderately high, high re highly resistant to fatigue, and they also use, they generate some ATP by anaerobic glycolysis, okay? So, but they have a faster contraction, remember, or twitch, so how quickly they can twitch and be done twitching and ready for the next twitch. With the slow, it was 100 to 200. With these guys, they're faster, so it's it's down around 100, okay? Contribute to activities such as walking and sprinting. And then we have the last one here, which is the fast twitch. They're the largest in diameter, most powerful contraction, Almost no myoglobin content, which means that they're going to be white in color, or at least less red. Fewer blood capillaries, which also makes them less red. Uh, fewer mitochondria. We already said white in color. 
Uh, generate ATP mainly by glycolysis. Well, that's handy because it's in the name, fast glycolytic. Uh, fatigue quickly. They're not, they're not very efficient. Adapted for intense anaerobic movements of short duration, weightlifting or throwing a ball, something that is not going to last more than 30 seconds or so. Okay, so you you can't you can't keep this going. It's not a it's not built for endurance. Okay, now the thing is that most muscles are a mix of all three. Okay, okay, I mentioned that earlier. Most muscles you have you have all of these proportions may vary depending on the action of the muscles the person's training regimen and the genetic factors uh, i'm actually training for a long run right now so i'm trying to increase my number of slow oxidative and decrease my number of fast glycolytic i'm trying to make more of these these more efficient muscles okay because i'm doing endurance so um so postural muscles of the neck, back, and legs have a high proportion of slow oxidative. Muscles of the shoulders and arms have a high proportion of fast twitch, fast glycolytic. Leg muscles have large numbers of both slow oxidative and fast oxidative glycolytic. Okay, so so humans pretty much are built for endurance when it comes to when it comes to walking. I know we have sprinters, uh, but pretty much we we have the slower the slower twitch muscles in our legs uh, because we're we're Presumably, endurance animals. We walk and we we get around uh, on a regular basis by by walking. Okay, so on some in some way the ratios. Remember, because it contains all of them, the ratios of flat, fast to slow are genetically determined in some way. However, you can um, you can change this. Okay. Uh, so individuals with a higher portion of FG excel in intense activity like weightlifting and sprinting, and uh, the ones people with slow oxidative excel in endurance activities. Okay, so I hope I'm not going too fast, but this is really the main point right here, or this is one of the main points, is that um, this is something that people want to know that they can do. Aerobic exercise transforms some fast glycolytic into the fast oxidative glycolytic. It doesn't turn them into uh, the slow oxidative necessarily, but it can it can get rid of some of these. So it can it can usually take you one step. Okay. So remember we have fast glycolytic, we have fast oxidative glycolytic, and we have slow oxidative. You can usually change your muscle type from let's say slow oxidative to fast oxidative glycolytic or you can go back in this direction or you can go in this direction and change it to this. So your workout, so we've already been talking about some of this fitness stuff. Um, in addition to increasing vascularization, increasing the number of mitochondria, you can actually change your muscle type to some degree. Okay, to kind of help you prepare. Okay, um, so if you want to become more fit overall, which is probably healthier because you also get the benefits of the, the increased vascularization. Um, it's just, uh, this tends to be, aerobic tends to be healthier. Um, then, then you want to, you want to sort of practice these endurance types of exercises. Exercises that require short bursts, if you want to enlarge your muscles, if you want to become larger, then you would use these short bursts. You wouldn't have, uh, we, we say that you wouldn't have as many reps or um, you would do you would do more quick short burst types of exercises to increase size this hypertrophy okay so that's it um, this is showing the uh, the difference between everything uh, between these different types the slow twitch slow oxidative fast oxidative glycolytic and fast glycolytic um, so these are the more efficient ones are red the less efficient ones but more powerful ones are white uh, and that's because of myoglobin um, myosin ATP activity um, and that's that's one thing I, I failed to mention is is why is one of them a faster twitch than another and that's really because the myosin will hydrolyze that ATP remember the myosin is the one that's grabbing and pulling on the actin well, in some muscles, this can happen very, very quickly. It's just a slightly different myosin molecule that can pull more, more quickly, and that's the um, 
that's uh, that's what causes this to happen. Okay, so diameter, your slow twitch tend to be smaller, your fast twitch t tend to be larger, uh, and then this is in the middle, um, and then and then some of the other things we we mentioned. Um, Capillary density, you, you tend to have more capillaries feeding these, the slow oxidative, than you do the fast. Um, this is using the, the slow oxidative or using aerobic. Um, they're using the mitochondria. This is using glycolysis. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully this makes sense. Okay.